Now, in our church, we don't have many traditions. We have, we have some traditions, a few traditions. One of the traditions we have is once a year, we go to Shepherd Center. We support Shepherd Center, but once a year, we go there physically, not to check out where our money has gone, but to just be with Pastor Jacob. And of course, I see him almost every month, but I want us to see where our money is going. Listen, Shh. listen carefully. Listen carefully. You need to see where your money goes. We are strategic in our giving. All right? We don't just give money for the sake of giving, and that's good. It's called random giving. For example, your children got a friend uh, in school, and, the, and, and his friend needs money, and you go home and you raise money with your friends and your parents and all of that. That's random giving. That's good. But we are strategic. We want to know where our finances go. And so we are strategic now giving. So our tradition is that at least once a year we go to Shepherd Center, we have makan with them, we just kind of hang out with them, uh, and we love doing that. So tomorrow, if you're free, join us. So as I was talking about giving just now, <clears throat> this is not to scold you or to make you feel guilty. That is not our that's not our plan. But I will want to teach you because I want you to have a great 2018. So when you come to the end of the year 2018, you will see how God has blessed you, strengthened you, prospered you, did wonderful miracles for you and your family. And the things that you didn't have in 2017, God's got it ready for you in 2018. Amen. Amen. So that's what I want to set you up. I want you to think like that. We don't just teach you about giving. Anybody can give. And I thank God that you are a big bunch of givers. But I want to teach us about how we are supposed to live generous lives. Not just do things, but be generous people. Big-hearted people like our God. Now, there are many NGOs that are doing work, and we are not competing with them. In fact, we are supporting them, and they are supporting us. Thank God for that. There are many churches that are giving out to many ministries and we thank God for the generosity of many churches. But I just want to say that we as a church have identified where the money will go when we give. So we are specific about giving to Shepherd Center and then all the other churches that are still dependent on us like Kappa and also our, our young people um, that are here from overseas for them to, you know, chauffeur them to the church because they, they, many of them are um, they're not well paid, they're poor and they want to come to church. And so we are specific about what we do every year. Just to let you know, just in general, not bragging, but this is about you. If I boast, if I brag, I'm bragging about you. Both this church and our KL church in your generosity. Over these past 23 years, of course we've been giving further, but I'm saying 23 years because of Shepherd Center, that's how many years Shepherd Center has been under us. And by the way, I just wanted you to know, you own Shepherd Center. This church gave birth to Shepherd Center. 23 years ago, Jacob came to see me. He had a beard, looked really sickly, and he had about a, just a few, his three children, and about a three, you can go there and find out the story. I forgot the story, but he reminds me. They came to my house, said, Pastor, can I come under your church? I said, sure, you're welcome. I said, you love God? I said, yes. I said, do you read your Bible? I said, yes, Pastor. I said, okay, you got it? We shook hands. That's it. 23 years later, there are churches that are coming to Shepherd Center. You don't know this because we never br brag about this. Glad Tidings, Calvary Church, and a few other churches, I'm told, have come and said, why don't you come under us? Our churches are bigger, we are wealthier, we can do more for you. Somehow, Pastor Jacob recognized that from the day he said yes, and until today, he is not dependent on men, he is dependent on God. And God has provided miraculously. We have 17 buildings given to Shepherd Center. Many of you don't know about these things. It's fantastic miracles that God has done in providing. We, we don't write letters, we don't say, please support. When I go and preach in England, like recently I preached in Australia, my friend said, why didn't you bring photos? Our people can support you. I said, I didn't come to your country to raise money. We are not beggars. We are men and women of faith. We trust the mighty God. Amen. So God has taken care of him. So our traditions have always been not begging people, but positioning you so that God can bless you. Not one time. Oh, one time I gave. Somebody was poor. I saw a beggar. I gave. That's good. That's very good. Not random acts of giving. 
but focusing our giving by being generous people. And again, it's not the amount. It's our heart that's being generous. So today I want to share with you something from, from the gospel, uh, sorry, from the epistle of John. And if God is speaking to your heart today, and if you've not been involved in our faith and our missions work before, jump in today. Can I go a bit further, a little bit further? Some of you got non-Christian colleagues who run, non uh, who run companies, you know, they run companies. They are not Christian. Giving is, you don't have to be a Christian to be a giver. Anybody can give. And there are non-Christians who want to probably cut down on their income taxes or whatever. And so they must give towards charity. Isn't that right? They must give towards charity. And so they're looking for works they can support. So you sitting in the office, don't just sit there. Share what you're doing. Show them the new works that we are planning to support, like the kids in Orang Asli. We, yesterday, I think Pastor Das sent me about 63 photos. So we're going to be popping all of them. People want to be involved in some kind of a charity work. Maybe you know a company where they give away vans and lorries. Let's get a van for the Orang Asli ministry. Amen? Let's give it to Pastor Das so he can drive, carry all those things. Let's be big-hearted and generous. Amen? Amen. All right. I, I talk too much about the giving because this is very, very exciting. Listen, some non-Christians are willing to partner with you. Like, I've got non-Christians who live in Glen Mary Cove who are going to Shepherd Center or want to go to Shepherd Center tomorrow. They're not even Christian. Their motivation is, I'm a human being and I want to be a better human being. But for you who are Christians, our motivator, our motivation goes much deeper. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the thing that motivates me is not because I see photos of naked children, hungry people in Africa, then we give. Through our years of giving, over these 23 years, I didn't tell you how much you have given, or did I? I didn't tell you yet, yeah? You know how much you have given. This is on record in our church. Just our mission. This is not your tithe. This is not building. We are one of the few churches till today are doing missions pledge. Most people will do a mission Sunday. One Sunday, collect one offering, give it away. We do it year after year. Now, in 23 years, Kim Ju has been around for a long time. And others have been here who have moved on, but they have been generous in supporting. In our past 23 years, according to the figures that we have in our office, this is how much you have given. Are you ready? You didn't know this, but I want to shock you. This is what you have given. And remember, every cent you gave never comes back, never sits in this church. We don't use it for administration, salaries, advertisement, nothing. 100% comes, 100% goes out. All right? This is how much you have given. Ready? 2,475,235 ringgit. That's how much you have given. Give the Lord. Up. I thank God. Whether you give or don't give, money has been going out towards these works. And we thank the Lord that that's what the generous people of God are. I thank God I'm pastoring a, a church of generous, big-hearted, not stingy-minded people. Big-hearted. Big-hearted. So my motivation today and my speaking today is taken from 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. Sorry, 1 John chapter 3. Verses 16 to 20. First John, this is the first epistle of John. Now John, who is writing this epistle, is now an old man. When he first started following Jesus, he was about 13 to 15 years old. He was a very young man. So there's hope for our youth. Come on, young people. You know, he started following Jesus when he was just such a young boy. Now decades have passed by. He's an older man. So he is one of the last apostles. Most of them have been executed and martyred. John is writing to a group of Christians and he writes these words. He says, For by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods, or if anyone has enough, and sees his brother in need, and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or in, in, or in talk, but in deed and in truth. 
How many of you this morning can put your hand up? If you don't know, don't give me the answer. But how many of you know the love of God? You have been delivered from something. You know you are set free. You know if you close your eyes and die today, you would say Christ is enough for me. Not I need another banker. I need more money. I need more friends. No, Christ. How many of you know deep down in your heart what the love of God has done in your life? Can I see your hand? Quite a few of you. Some of you, you're still dead, but that's okay. We'll wait for you. By the end of this service, we pray that you will know the love of God in your heart. Because He does love you. Whether you are good or bad, He has chosen to love you. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. We have bad days and good days as pastors just like anybody else. So don't think that because we are pastors, we got extra clouds pushing us up as we are floating in this earth. We fall and hurt just like anybody else. Can you say amen? amen. But we know. Everybody say, I know. I know the love of God. Now, if you've experienced that, if you've experienced that in your heart, you know the love of God. You know you're different today than you were many years ago. You know you are different because you know in your heart there's no condemnation. God never looks at you and condemns. People do. Christians are famous in condemning other people, very famous, judging. But you know that Christ never treats you that way. Amen? There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So, I want you to realize in this verse, in verse 16 to verse 18, isn't it? Verse 16 to verse 18 or 20. We all know this verse in John 3.16, alright? We all know this, the moment you got saved, you memorize. Everybody say it out with me, John 3.16. For God so well that he, he gave. So love is equated with God loves you so much. He was not forced to come down into this world to die for you. He didn't say, oh, yeah, because I'm Jesus Christ gone, I must go and die for these useless people. No, he loved us, so he gave. So he equates the loving and the giving of ourselves together. So in the light of what we read, go back to first. John chapter 3 verse 16 it says because we know by this we know we we know love all right we know what love is about how do we know it because he laid down he gave all right he set aside his life for us now let's read it again because some of us will conveniently read this differently let's why you do that press the verse crashed. So you're trying to tell me you need a new computer. Is that what you're trying to tell me, Matthew? <laughs> so we go back to that verse. We'll give you time to uncrash. It's okay. So the verse simply says this. Alright, let me read it for you. It says, by this we know love. By this we know love. That he laid down his life for us, so we ought to lay down our lives for him. Is that what it says? Okay, because you're not reading. See, never brought your Bibles and you're depending on the screen. <laughs> huh? It says, by this we know love. What is love? He laid down his life for us. Then he says, and we lay down our lives for others. I know we would like to say, so that we also lay down our lives for Jesus. We give our lives to Jesus. We love him so much, we die for him. He doesn't say that in the Bible. He says, if you say you really love God, just like he laid down his life for you, you lay down your life for others. For others. And that's the whole purpose of our missions pledge. For 23 years. That's older than some of you were not even born yet into this world, Sherin. Before you were even born, we were giving. Were you born? Of course. You're 25, huh? Don't joke. Only yesterday you told me you were 18. So we know that if you love, you lay down in the light of what Jesus is saying. We ought to lay down our lives for others. And this is the whole purpose. Look, we don't even know these people. We don't, I don't know every kid in Shepherd Center. I don't know the Orang Asli or Orang Utan. So I don't know nothing. I know it's a wonderful work that they are doing. And I know our men's fellowship would love to go to Rao. They, they like the four-wheel drive. They want to go to the hutan. They like what? Pastor, I don't like. 
I like to be safe. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go, I'll go. So, okay. So, Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give you. Can you imagine? He's telling his disciples, and he's going to die any moment now. He's saying, guys, listen, I got a new commandment. Oh, the guys must have been excited. These are his last words. He's telling them a new commandment. There were so many commandments. They remember the commandments of Moses. They remember the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do to you, right? Golden rule. Jesus said, this one is much better, and you got it up there. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. They must have got, uh, love one another. We heard that. But he said, no, no, no. It's another standard. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. It's a different level altogether. Different level altogether. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. So, how can I love like Jesus did? How can I lay aside my life for others? All right? I'm not telling you to go to Nepal or go to Africa and die. These are just things that we have strategized to help you because I really believe that as we get involved in our church and in the mission of our church, I mean, in a couple of years, we are going to be building our new C3 Clang building. All of you know that. We are definitely going, in five years, we must finish the building. And you're thinking, Pastor, how are you doing all this thing? KL, we got building. Here, Clang, we got new building to start. How are we doing refugee school? It's because of the great, big, generous heart of our people. So we're going to be building a brand new building for our Clang Church. And then we're looking for other opportunities. So how do we lay down our lives? A couple of weeks ago, I was with my son-in-law, Brad, and Anna. And of course, my grandson in Australia is now three years old. He's so handsome like his grandfather. He's so good looking. And then the second baby is only three months. He is like a bulldog. He looks like Nikki in a baby, baby mode, you know, like that. Very tough, very strong. And I... As I was sitting down, going to have dinner, it was 7 o'clock in the evening, about 6.45. Brad takes the first boy, Taj, says, give grandpa a good night kiss. And Taj comes up to me, grandpapa, he calls me, and he hugs me, gives me a kiss. No arguing, no fighting, no crying, eh, nothing. Takes him straight up, puts him on the bed, gives him a good night kiss, and comes down and has dinner. He does the same with the three-month-old baby. Takes a small fella, put him up. No fuss from the babies, no crying, no tantrum, nothing. I was amazed because we, in the old school, you know how we put our children to sleep. Araro, rock, 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 up, down, bouncing, and bouncing until the children's brains are all mangled up, and then they fall asleep. This one, nothing. And I said to Brad, how do you do it? He says, Papa, he says, very easy. He says, before the children came, you know, they live in Australia, it's, it's the place to party. They said, every night we were partying before the children came. Beautiful beaches, nice lakes, great restaurant. Every night for about two or three years when they just got married. So once the children came, they disciplined themselves to lay aside their party time for the kids. I said, you're amazing. I, I should have learned from him. I used to bounce Debbie like that and Anna like this and shake them. And they just put the babies down. It's because they said, well, we just decided we're going to, for a few years, put aside our private life of partying and doing all of that. And then Anna has just been installed, just as we did with Pastor Dad, as the pastor, one of the associate pastor, a young adult pastor in the church she's attending. So their lives are busy, but yet they said, we lay aside. When it comes for the kids, we lay aside. Today, applying to this message, God is also speaking to all our hearts. And he's saying, how can you do it? Show the love of God in a practical way. So in verse 17, it says, If someone has worldly goods, if someone has enough, everybody say enough, and sees others struggling but does not respond to that need, how can the love of God, how can you say that you have been set free by the love of God? How can you say, John is now writing as an older man. He's saying, don't talk 
a good game. You, how many of you heard the term talk a good game? How many of you played sports before? Football? Anybody? The rest of you, you don't, when you were young, I'm talking, not now. But <laughs> any of you used to play football, basketball, badminton, whatever, karate, taekwondo? They have a saying that when some people talk before the game, hey, don't worry, we're going to win, we're going to play so well, I'm going to play so well, I'm so good. I have that with golfers as well. Kim Ju is smiling. Because some of our golfing friends, bro, we partner together today, don't worry, bro. First hole, I will take. The first hole, 18 holes, right? In the first hole, I'll take, bro, I'll get a par, if not birdie, bro, no problem. And they will talk, talk, bet $50. Have to bet. I also have to, even though I'm a Christian. But the money, of course, goes to the makan. Everybody put down, I have to put down. He will talk, 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 talk a good game. But when he gets on the course, he plays like shit. <laughs> Lousy, I'm thinking, Badu, are you you're promising playing a good game? Oh, sorry, la, bro, I didn't see properly. Oh, my. And there are people like that who talk a good game. I love God. If I die, I'm going to heaven. Oh, I love Jesus. I'll serve Jesus. I do this. I'll do that. I'll do that. Pastor, sign me. And I'm blah, blah. suddenly disappeared. So don't talk a good game. Can somebody say amen? You're gone very quiet. Very quiet now. You're making me nervous, huh? Don't talk a good game. So let's get to this thing about our stuff. He says, John says, if a man has worldly goods, and he basically saying he has enough. Now, when we look at that verse, we can say, I got a loophole there. You know, I can escape this verse. It definitely doesn't apply to me. Why? Because I don't have enough. Listen carefully. I don't have enough. So enough is a subjective term, depending. What is enough for me may not be enough for you because your expenses are bigger. Are you following me? Is this clear? What may be enough for me because I don't have any children now all grown up and gone may not be enough for you because your children are still small and children are very expensive. And slowly they start going to college and you must give them the very best. And then all their friends have got the latest iPhone, you've got to get your kids the latest iPhone too. So pastor, really, I don't have enough. Okay, listen carefully. Listen, everybody listen here. 10, 15 years ago, your salary is not the same as your salary now. Am I correct? 15 years ago, your salary was enough for you then. Am I correct? Obviously, it has to be correct. It was enough for you because if it was not enough for you, you would be dead. Today, you won't be alive. You would have died 15 years ago. <laughs> so 15 years ago, your salary was enough. But what you earned 15 years ago won't be enough for today because expenses and... Are you following me? Yeah. 15 years from now, the salary you are getting may not be enough for you 15 years from now. So you've got to trust God to bless you, give you breakthroughs. Are you following me? 15 years ago, the car you were driving is not enough for you. I know the car I was driving 15 years ago is not enough for me today. Why? Because my guests who come, they're all big. So I have to have a big car. Their bags weigh when they, oh my goodness, these people, I don't know what they put in their bags when they come to Malaysia. It's heavier than my fridge. <laughs> and you have to carry it. So I need a bigger than I needed one 15 years ago. Some of you, you're standing by your Apple store or wherever you go and buy your mobile phone and you're sending a message to your friends on Instagram or Facebook or WhatsApp and you're telling them, I'm standing in line waiting to buy my new phone, but you're sending that message on your old phone. How many of you know that God is a good God? That he loves you? He wants you to have nice things. But John here is writing a warning to us. This is a warning from an old senior man who's been with the Lord. He talks about the love of God from experience because he was a man when he was young. He stood there and watched his Lord get crucified because of love and die for us. So now he's writing to us and he is warning us, when will enough be enough for you? Be careful not allowed to allow 
not to allow the world's desire in fear and in stingy mindedness the world is stingy minded they are so scared if they don't buy this now somebody else might buy it and so they have this fear you as a child of god you know the love of god he said how much more you ought to learn when enough is enough how many of you walked to your bed your your wardrobe today open your wardrobe and saw all the clothes there and say i don't know what to huh all the shoes they hire i don't know what to wear that's because god has blessed you and you're living in a huge margin thank god for that i'm not condemning don't get me wrong i'm like that too thank god for his blessing but maybe before the year ends make sure the clothes that you 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 have that you want to give away because you know fashion is gone or you grew out of it or you grew thinner and you can't use that now pack it all up and give it away so that new clothes can come all things are passed away behold new clothes are coming in but you've got to come to a place where you've got to say enough is enough i'm going to learn how to share the margin that he has given me i've got that much and i want to if i say i love god because here's here's the deal guys as we get ready to close he says that <clears throat> it's impossible you see desiring things is not a bad thing but it's like an appetite and like an appetite if you are hungry you can never say i'm eating enough so you keep feeding that appetite and so he says how can you say the love of god dwells in you when you don't know how to be like god he's generous he loved he gave so when is enough for me when is enough so you need to decide that in 2017 as we close this year and you're opening to a brand new year of favor and blessing from god that you want god to bless you rain down upon you protect you sustain you so you don't have to be worrying is the hospital bill is the doctor's bill doctor's report going to be bad i'm frightened and then at the same time you're singing cries is enough for me tears coming down cry really is he enough for you is he really enough for you because one day when we are about to close our eyes young old rich poor doesn't matter you will want to say truly i thank god that christ because your wife is not going to hold your hand and take you to heaven your doctor is not going to promise you eternal life when he's holding your pulse and counting down your heartbeat it's only christ so i'm not trying to preach a guilt i don't want you to feel guilty when it comes to giving don't want you to feel condemned or i'm not giving enough no 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 learn to live in an in an attitude in an area where you can honestly say that's enough for me you can walk away from a plate with food still probably a little bit left there enough my stomach can only take so much and same with other appetites in life enough now god wants you to have in abundance but you've got to not be like the world with a scarcity mentality a scarcity mentality if i don't grab it now i'll never get it who's going to sustain me god will sustain you in 2018 what guarantee do you have in 2018 who's going to promise you a great life in 2018 nobody can nobody can fulfill any promise they make politicians fail business people fail husbands wives we all fail nobody can promise the best of our life only god through his word will be there for you 2018 so what are you going to do what kind of mindset are you going to have so as the musicians come and as we stand sing this song christ is enough before we stand and sing please sit down do you have pencils do you have pencil you just have to write on that paper you don't have to give anything now in fact our first service people were so enthusiastic they started throwing money inside i said no end of the year it's supposed to be you know month by month start next next year don't start now but somebody just threw in and this man i thank god for that maybe he promised this year and didn't fulfill i don't know but i'm glad he did so please if you're new here please don't write anything on the paper we're just happy that you're here if you don't understand this uh uh missions pledge and say why are we so generous 
Go and see the people in our office. Ask them, how much did we really give? Pastor said, two million something. Is that true? Over 23 years. Go and find out. Ask questions. You need to know where your money, I need to know where my money is. So I go and preach in Australia. And I preach in the UK. They will say, why didn't you bring your photos of the orphanage? I said, I didn't come here to raise funds from you. So we are not here to try to guilt trip you. Just uh, three days ago, on Friday, a pastor contacted me. So pastor and he's a businessman. Pastor Kasif knows him. And he contacted me, wanted me to meet him on Thursday, 7 o'clock. So I said, what for? Oh, well, he wants to invite you to preach in India. Now listen carefully. I have never been to India, even though I'm an Indian, but I'm really a Malaysian. I'm Malaysian. I'm 61 years old. I have never been to India, never had any desire to go to India at all. Even though my grandfather, my, my grandfather came from India, my father's been to India, but I have never. All my brothers who are pastors, they have been to India. I never, I've been to China. I've been to Africa. I've been to Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam. Never been to India. But this guy, when he spoke to me, and with Pastor Kasif, he said, I've been fasting and praying before I come and talk to you, Pastor. When somebody says that, it really breaks <laughs> my He said, I've been fasting and praying. Our church in India wants to invite you in Chennai. They have about 1,200 people and they are having a huge seminar for pastors. So go Thursday, come back Sunday. Listen, I've never been to India. But when he said, I've been fasting and praying, I immediately said, yes, I'll go. I'm not looking forward to it because we hear all the stories, but I'll go. But listen carefully. I can go here and preach there and preach whatever it is. End of the day, this is my home. This is the place God has placed us together to partner with you to do the work of God. So it's nice to be a guest speaker. It's beautiful. People drive you. Oh, you wrote to me, we booked your hotel. We've done this. Very nice. But that's not home. This is home. This is where God has placed us. So, while there are many churches doing great things, we don't support all these things. We thank God for them. We're not in conflict. We support the things God has asked us and put in our care. So we know strategically where we are going. Are you with me? Is this clear enough or is it too difficult? Okay. You want me to preach another? I can preach another hour. Simpler message. No, I'm joking. This is simple, yeah? Very easy. So how can we say the love of God dwells in us? when we don't know how to lay aside lay aside this amount that amount whatever it is and cons consistently every month faithfully make sure that that's fulfilled God will bless you so as we sing this chorus I'm sure you wrote everything down the stewards can come and collect that please we're not collecting an offering now we're collecting your faith pledge so write it down your name what you want to do and put it into that bucket. <laughs> then in closing, I will pray, but let's all, after you've done that, let's stand together and worship the Lord.